everyone, I'm Jared Samuels, and uh, today I'm bringing you the 34th episode of What's Behind the Game, where you'll get an exclusive look at how all your favorite athletes eat, train, and anything else you'd like to know. Today on the show, we have Jonathan Parr, who is a PT, a physical therapist uh, at his own physical, ther physical therapy company they started, Parr PT, and was also a uh, competitor on American Ninja Warrior. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited. Yeah. Th thanks so much for coming on. So my first question okay. is like, my first question is, uh, what's your story? So it really started, uh, I was a military brat. So my dad was military. Um, we, man, since I was a baby really traveled around, I was in Germany for four years, uh, bounced around all through Texas. And, uh, one of the biggest things is growing up in the military, having the exposure to obstacles, uh, you know, something that I always liked to do as a kid and do it with my dad. And, you know, really that set the tone for my desire to want to do American Ninja Warrior. Uh, I was always involved with sports. So I played soccer for many, many years. I also played basketball. Um, you, I really just try to try any sport. Um, the one sport that wasn't really good for me was golf. Uh, that was probably the trickiest sport out of them all, thinking that I could – adapt pretty easy but that definitely was not my uh my strongest yeah um but <laughs> being able to do all that was kind of cool though because you know you go to lacrosse you go to tennis you go to soccer and then you know you you really catch all the movement patterns especially with me being a pt uh looking at biomechanics and how that feeds into success on a show like american ninja warrior it was that much easier to want to pursue that um once i basically analyzed it from a PT standpoint um because this didn't actually happen until after I graduated from PT school oh okay um, having that knowledge really kind of even vamped it forward that much more um before you know actually competing you know over the course of those six seasons so having like the the broad base of knowledge from playing different sports and then the the like the book knowledge kind of from the PT that all kind of coalesced together for the yeah industry. yeah it, it's really that whole motor control like whether you're using your hands whether you're using your feet whether you're on the ground whether you're on dirt like all those different variables in your environment um, it's, it's really what ninja warrior is because you're always having to do something different it looks different it's shaped different it spins differently so these um different variables always you know it, it was easier to train for because having used that athletic background to be able to apply it and how did you get in, get started with American Ninja Warrior? Did someone like recruit you or did you like, how does that work? <laughs> Actually, uh, I had always seen the show Wipeout on TV and I thought it was the coolest oh, show yeah. ever. Just being able to get on and get flung by, uh, you know, whatever obstacle they have that punches you out into the water. Yeah. And uh, over time, I actually one of my patients said, hey, have you ever seen the show Ninja Warrior? I said, no, I've never seen it. So. I tuned in back in, I think it was season three, saw it, I thought it was really cool. And um, over time, over those few years, he was like, hey, I think you should really do it. Cause he saw me doing events like Tough Mudders and Spartans and all these really extreme events. And finally I was like, you know what? Let's just try it. Let's just uh, submit it. And so I had this really, oh my God, disgraceful video, which <laughs> I thought I was doing really good athletic stuff. You know, me doing like two one-on push-ups and me yeah. jumping on something that wasn't very high just you know you're having to show <laughs> your athletic skills in this video as a way to impress them and I look back and I'm like man that was awful but <laughs> I got the opportunity um there is a story component and I think they like the story of what I did with a lot of neurological conditions for physical therapy they kind of just used that as a, a combination for me to be able to basically compete on the um and that's when I got chosen my first shot and from there, it was six years in a row after that, and just kept it going. Was it, I, I didn't write this down, but was it intimidating uh, competing, like, on television? You, you know, the, the funny thing about it is because I didn't know much about it, it really didn't bother me. I just thought it was one of those things that maybe 300 people watched. So I didn't realize that thousands of people would actually watch it. So when I did my first season in Denver, um, I actually uh, competed with Sean Merriman, a linebacker from the San Diego Chargers. Yeah, yeah. And he was one of the guys there. And I was like, oh, man, I think this is a little bit more intense than I originally thought. Um, there was also a UFC fight. I can't remember the, his name for the life of me, but 
at the time he was very popular and I started thinking, I was like, okay, this might be more extreme than what I really thought. Uh, but again, because I didn't know anyone, I just kind of just went through it. I did well. And, you know, after that, kind of got the itch to like, oh, I think I can do better. I think I can do, you know, go to the finals and all this. And after that, it just kind of drove me into training more and, you know, really fell in love with the sport. Mm. And how do you how do you train for something like that? Like, how do you train for an obstacle course? So what I thought back in the day was more military style where you're just doing like push-ups and pull-ups and maybe a rope climb and jump in. And um, granted, that didn't help me out really much the first year. Um, you know, not being able to climb a 14-foot wall takes a little bit more uh, specific train, not just running up walls, but being able to time your steps, being able to get your power on inclines. And, you know, all these things, it really opened my eyes. I'm like, wow, this, this is like a – you're you're really gathering all these different sports and tying them together so what you find is like gymnastics you know being able explosive and being able to do flips and um being or excuse me having that spatial awareness where you, where you are in space when you're jumping or bouncing uh, trampoline work then you get things like rock climbing you know having that grip to put your fingers on these little ledges that you're you think you're not really supposed to be able to do but being able to train that way so you're, you're really doing a lot of cross training um, and, and, and trying to almost like you're thinking of your own obstacles of what might actually appear in order to train. So, you know, one of the things I tell most people that, you no, know, the balance on the show looks easy, but how do you prepare? Well, things may be on level, things spin forward and backwards, things spin rotationally, things spin side to side, or maybe it doesn't spin, maybe, maybe or not, excuse me, maybe it doesn't um, spin, but maybe you have to bounce on something. Is it bouncing on something high? Do you have to bounce something with small ledges? It's like all these things when you're training, you have to keep in mind. So ultimately when you get there, you would have tried to prepare for everything that you think they can throw at you. And chances are, it's still not going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, I'm just trying to imagine trying to prepare for something that you like, you don't know, you don't know the course beforehand, right? No, or no, you don't know yeah. until really, uh, you know, you have your uh, walkthrough. Uh, where they have someone demonstrate it and mm. after that it's like okay you got one shot you know you train for nine months for <laughs> yeah. it could be five seconds it could be two minutes it could be five minutes it's like you know there, there's a lot more that goes into that sport than you know that's really shown on tv there it's, it's very demanding it's very mentally fatiguing uh, you know keeping in mind when you're up there on the platform they specifically put those lights to shine right in that water so you know you mess up, you're going swimming. Uh, yeah. And that, that can really throw your, throw your game off. So being able to tune that out, being able to tune out the cameras, uh, the, the crowd cheering your name, you have to zone in and really, really, um, you know, focus on what you're trying to do without distractions. Yeah. Dang. Oof. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, and you talked about it a little bit with your like athletic past, but why did you decide to go into physical therapy? Yeah, you know, I, I have had a, a love for sports for quite some time. Um, you know, again, mentioning my athletic background, I was like, oh, it'd be cool to do athletic training and work with athletes. And that my mind was just athletes, athletes, athletes. And so um, when I was 16, my sister got diagnosed with a neurological condition called acute disseminating encephalomyelitis. So she essentially, it was like a, a version of MS, not really being diagnosed at it, but it presented very similar. So she ended up having a lesion in her brain that left her paralyzed on her right side. And she was only 21. So she was extremely young. And so me being 16 and watching her through that process really, um, really changed my mindset. Okay, do I really want to work with sports or do I want to be able to help someone like my sister? You know, not knowing the severity of her condition, I didn't know if it was going to be a long-term thing to where she was going to need those type of services for the rest of her life. Um, and at the time my parents didn't have insurance, so they were paying out of pocket. So that even, that, that drove me even more to really, I was like, you know, I got to do something because I don't want my parents to have to pay for it either. So that, that's what really got me into really focusing on, okay, let me be a physical therapist. I always have that option for sports, but you know, my, my passion was well, helping those that had, you know, complex conditions and, you know, that needed a little bit more special attention. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the patients you work with, do you work only with patients with like 
uh, those kinds of conditions or is it more traditional patients as well or what kinds of patients do you work with? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'd say I have, a, I have a big, um, I've been a therapist 10 years now and more of my specialty has been in, in, in complex conditions. So it ranges from brain injuries, strokes, spinal cord injuries, uh, chronic illness, um, like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, dysautonomias. It's more of the extremely tricky uh, I would say that's a big portion of what I see. Uh, I do see a lot of your, you know, chronic pains or your athletic injuries or, um, you know, kind of your day-to-day -day stuff. But I, I would say more of my specialty is in the more extreme cases. Hmm. And so uh, can you, um, well, can you give us, before I ask this next question, can you give us an example? Like, actually, we'll tie it in this example. So let's say a new patient comes in with you. Um, what's your process of assessing them? And maybe you can like bring in an example. You don't have to name names or anything, but like your process of assessing someone with a more extreme condition. Yeah, and I, I over the years I've learned a lot from some really therapists and been able to uh, learn a few tricks and learn some more concepts of okay, what really should be targeted. So I came up with more what I call a three systems approach, whereas I'm looking at the autonomic system. So for those that don't know, your autonomic system controls like your vital functions and, you know, that fight or flight, everyone knows the fight or flight response when things are, you know, in danger, you react a different way, you have this superhuman strength type thing. But yeah. also that can actually cause more stress. Um, so people with chronic illness or, or more complex injuries, they have issues with regulating that. So that's the first one that I, I, I tend to target. Um, the vestibular system, so that resides in your inner ear. So that's responsible for your, like your coordination, your balance, uh, coordination between your eyes and your head. Uh, a lot of times after injuries, and let's just take a concussion or a traumatic brain injury, having to um, having that foundation of that system is key to even just functioning. So without considering that, it, it's hard to get them to the point that not only that they can go back to their day to day, but maybe if they want to get back into some sort of performance. Um, and lastly, I work a lot with the stomach. Um, that's a very rare thing that's worked on with physical therapy. So it could be, you know, with irritable bowel syndrome or constipation or just some kind of wonky gut stuff going on that um, actually affects the body, you know, the, 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 the stomach, the enteric system that's involved for controlling some of the stomach work can actually work separately from the brain. So when we're thinking about recovery, having those three systems tied together together ultimately sets your foundation to be able to tolerate just your day-to-day -day and hopefully return to some sort of performance depending on where they were at before um when you say work with your stomach are you talking about like diet or are you are you literally talking about some sort of physical working because in terms of like when i think of uh working I, on stomach, i'm literally I mean, talking more like actual nerve related and like structural issues. Yes, hmm. structural issues. Oh, okay. Huh. So, I mean, for an example, if someone were to come in with some form of constipation, I, there are certain even like uh, massage techniques and more hands-on approaches that I do that will actually target the organs itself um, to function the way they need, they need to. Hmm. That's interesting. I never thought of that. I always thought of just changing your yeah, diet yeah, or it, eating more. It's pretty interesting. Cause... Eat, eating more fiber, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, the diet is a big component. I, I think that, you know, you look at, I mean, let's just say these, these professional athletes, they, I mean, they could just have some sort of GI issue or some sort of uh, gastrointestinal issue that's causing maybe repetitive trauma. Um, just understanding that compensation is for everything. And that that's really what, to make it a little bit more simp uh, simplistic is I specialize in reducing compensation so you can function. So even just by having stomach issues, that causes you to compensate posturally, uh, compromised posture causes different mechanics, different mechanics causes injury. So th this is where more of my specialized training goes into, okay, yes, even though you may not be returning to a sport, but just, just to get up and move, there, there's certain foundational elements that you need to get things started, which is where I feel like, in my opinion, most of the chronic pain starts is not having that foundation. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with someone, how do you work on, let's say their strength, 
versus their flexibility? I, I think a lot of it depends to, um, you know, my assessments are pretty thorough. They're like two hours long. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm having to consider all those systems that aren't really assessed, but based on that, I, I go into first, can you fire the muscle before we even do strengthening? So can you wire whatever's in your brain down to the muscle to get it fired? And typically most people can't um, that come in with some sort of injury. So I focus on usually their first month is to where they're learning how to just even fire. Even if they're, I mean, I've seen people, bodybuilders and five strong guys that they just don't have that connection from the brain to whatever muscle group it is. So that's where I start. I, I give them specific activities that involve more repetition to learn, okay, I can fire this, I can fire this. Once they get to that point, then I go into um, almost like a combination of movements with, um, I do everything with body weight. I tend to use body weight or maybe some bands, but everything is more body weight related. So someone learning how to lift their own body weight first before they apply some sort of external resistance, whether it's band or dumbbell related. Mm -hmm. I find that that works better. So based on that, I combine the actual movements through the full range. So not only are they getting the strengthening component, but they're also work, actually working on the flexibility or the range of motion component that's required to achieve that, that goal of, of, of strength. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes sense. You know, I do a lot of dynamic work too, you know, warm ups. you see, you know, on a soccer field or a football field, people running in there kind of lifting their arms and they do like side shuffles. All those are ways to get motion in the beginning. And then post session is when I start doing the, the flexibility because your muscles are already warmed up enough. Um, things are a little bit stretchier and then you can maximize your, your flexibility versus, you know, stretching before an event or something like that. Mm -hmm. In terms of, I'm just curious in general, what made you, want to move out, move outside like the traditional paradigm and kind of like focus on those other systems like the stomach, like you're talking about, what made you want to do you, that? You know, the biggest thing was when, I mean, we're taught in school and this goes across the board. Everything's a protocol, right? You know, mm -hmm. you have an arm injury, here's a piece of paper, you go to do your thing, but I understand everybody is not the same. Every person is so different. Even if they present the same, they're still different. So what might work for you from a like a, an activity may not stimulate that nerve like it would for me. So how can I change that? So when I started breaking it down, okay, well, if everyone's different, let me see what responses they give me when I first see them. Then it's easy for me to guide them into a different plan. I found that when I was trying to do more of your protocol based and here's step by step by step, I wasn't getting the results that I really desired. And I don't think the patient was getting what they fully desired like I and if they did it would take longer so I'm thinking okay financially uh efficient being a little bit more efficient with their time because what happens is when people are therapy for too long they drop off they don't really think it works and mm -hmm. I felt bad as a therapist you know watching people go through that I'm like okay what is really missing I feel like you know they should be able to do this but I'm not sure why they won't, don't get it well it's because I didn't really attend to these other systems and mm -hmm. when I started using these three Systems is when I started realizing, oh, okay, this works. And then I started researching more about it and try to develop some sort of program or some sort of philosophy behind using these systems as a way to complement your protocol based um, programs. You know what I mean? Yeah. How are you like now? Like, so it sounds like it's just a constant learning process. So, what about now, currently? What are you working on or thinking about to even like expand? sort of what you're doing and how you can help patients more? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I research all the time. I, I set a time hours during the week just to build more on this philosophy of the three systems. And what I'm finding is that each time I add more stuff, it just gets better and better and better. And so what I'm doing is, you know, really jotting these aside. And the ultimate goal is to be able to provide some sort of platform, um, an educational platform, whether they're PTs or trainers or whatever it might be. Um, cause it, it's basically universal. I mean, you don't have to be a physical therapist to think about these three systems. You just have to have an understanding about it. So it's easier to you know, get the job done and whatever it is that you're trying to do. So the ultimate goal is really to build some sort of program and educational platform to be able to teach people about this. And that way, you know, we're not limited to, to just Austin people getting better, it's, you know, nationwide, even worldwide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty awesome.
because I think a lot of people, and I, I was going to, this is my next question. What, what would you recommend for anyone interested in, in doing or being a physical therapist? And I think one of the things you're talking about is moving outside traditional paradigms and like look, focusing on school, but not just school, not just going by the book. Yeah, I think anyone who's trying to get into it has to understand that, you know, granted, I wasn't with this mindset five years ago. Um, you know, you grow as a clinician, and, and I think I'll be much better in five more years. But have an understanding that school is going to give you what you need um, and definitely provides a, a lot of information that's really necessary to be able to treat someone. But what you do afterwards and how you grow as a therapist is up to you. Because after school, I mean, they, you have no one else to teach you. So you're going to have to find your own passion. You know, maybe that passion isn't something related to this. Maybe it's something more towards, you know, geriatric population. Maybe there's a system that you want to create for them to make it to where they don't, you know, have as many falls. Or, but I, I really think that when you go into PT, you have to have a passion with something. You may not figure it out, like to be specific, but you have to know that you are really like what you do as a profession changes their life like completely completely changes their life you're not just giving them um you know a little bit of happiness for a week what you're doing is ultimately uh building their path to to success and having yeah. that mindset and you know taking that response it's a fun thing it shouldn't be as pressure but being able to take on that responsibility like what i'm trying to do is really trying to change the world mm -hmm. no that's great it's a great mindset do you have any, um, like a, I wrote favorite, but it doesn't have to be a favorite. Do you have like a, a patient success story that really stands out to you? I do. I do. Um, her, um, one, one of my clients. So initially when I started this in the beginning of the three systems and kind of using the whole ninja warrior, uh, exercise deal just to make it more exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where um, I had a, a girl that I saw, she actually had a brain tumor removal. Oh, she was in her late thirties. And what they did is they ended up actually having to um, remove the mass of the tumor, but they ended up having to cut her balanced nerve. So she couldn't even basically stand still. And she turned her head, she would fall over. Uh, very, very extreme case. And to where the point that, you know, being able to walk by herself would have been like a miracle, right? So, when I came across her, again, this is right during that time where I was one of those three systems that we got into fine tuning, building foundation, and to the point that she said, Hey, I, it would be great to do some obstacle course work again. I'm like, You know what? Why don't we train you for Ninja Warrior? Mm. She looked at me like I was crazy. But in my mind, I was thinking, Okay, I've seen you progress and it's been so quick that I think that you would actually have a, you know, you'd have a pretty good chance to be successful in the show. So we did that. And I tell you what, someone that's able to even compete on Ninja Warrior um, three seasons or two seasons, excuse me, uh, and she did well. She, I mean, she hung out there, you know, with the rest of them. And, you know, had she maybe not had one technical error, as we all do, she probably would have been someone that would have made national finals. So wow. you're thinking someone that at that point that just walking was a miracle to competing in front of millions of people against the most elite athletes in the world yeah that's amazing I mean, for me i was like man that was golden but it that's... goes to show you that when you really provide the right input to somebody and, and i'm not going to say it's going to work for everybody um just using professional judgment but it is possible and you build you build a good foundation um you know big things like that can happen it, it's 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 just amazing when you see it in person yeah one no, of my favorite that's got to be super rewarding. And yeah, that's pretty yeah. awesome. And you saw like her evolution. That's pretty great. Yeah, um, was, uh, so this is kind of the final question we ask everyone. And uh, I'm pretty excited to hear your answers. What are your top three recommendations for young athletes? I would say for, for really any athlete, when, you, when you're looking into elite training, there's far more that goes into elite training than just weights. And, and I, I think that schools, they do a good job of getting you physically ready, but being ready to, to, to compete at an elite level requires so much more um, than just, you know, whether it's balance, whether it's um, flexibility, whether it's 
um, you know, brain games. Uh, you know, I call them just being able to catch a ball, you know, juggle, those kind of things. There's a lot of things related just to reaction time and building core um, stability through breathing. I mean, there's a lot of really small things that make it that much better for an athlete to, um, to really separate themselves from most athletes. Mm-hmm. And I think when, when, when as, a, as the youth are beginning to grow and become more elite, I think they have to keep in mind that there's, there's always things to consider and that you need to look outside the box for those things. And you may not always find that when you're, you know, working with certain trainers. So if you're looking to be the best, look to train with people who already, you know, have been the best or have a really good experience with thinking outside the box with trainers. Because that, that's where I find most of the flaws in it is, is pure physicality versus pure agility and coordination and, and having mental stability. I mean, pressure is everything. I've seen the most elite athletes fail on, on the easiest things just because mentally they weren't ready. But, you know, I've seen average athletes perform exceptionally well with being able to have that mentality of, you know, no fear, no stress. So it, it's, it's components like that that are not typically physical that will make the difference in you being able to perform at elite level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've kind of like the theme we've had this whole episode is like broad base, thinking outside the box, mm-hmm. being different. That's no, great. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much yeah, for coming a- on. No, thank you. I appreciate it, man. Anytime. I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Um, how do people, so this is, a, this is a separate podcast. So, how do people um, get in touch with you? Uh, you can get at me on Instagram. Uh, it's at a JPAR flying squirrel underscore flying squirrel. Um, or it might be under actually at JPAR. So P as in potato, A R R fitness altogether. JPAR fitness. Um, and if they look me up on, you know, on Google, just Jonathan Parr, Ninja Warrior, they should be able to catch some of my, um, you know, pictures or runs or those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.